Welcome to the Industry Show. I'm your host, Nitin Bajaj, and joining me today is Lizzie Horwitz. Lizzie, welcome on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Nitin. Pleasure is all ours. So let's start with who is Lizzie? I am the CEO and founder of Finch, which decodes products' environmental impacts to help consumers make better purchasing decisions. Now that we know a little bit about you, let's play a little game. We call it the underrated, overrated. And uh, when you're ready, I'll throw maybe eight or 10 themes at you that are impacting us as a community. So I'm ready. ready. All right, let's do this. Let's start with NFTs. Overrated. <laughs> okay. Crypto. Overrated. Real estate prices. Underrated. Okay. Uh, what about stock market prices? Uh, underrated <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, let's see. What about inflation? Overrated. Okay. Uh, the metaverse. Overrated. The great resignation. Ooh. Underrated. Okay. And uh, cash. Underrated. Okay. That was uh, tricky. <laughs> what about uh, startup valuations? Startup valuations right now are uh, completely underrated. Okay. Uh, that was good. Thanks for playing along with me. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's get back to something more closer to you. Tell us about Finch. What is it? What is the, the mission and vision behind it? So I started Finch because I have been in the sustainability space for my entire career. And in 2016, something interesting started happening where I began to get a lot of questions from family and friends about how they could reduce their own footprint and what the effects of certain products were so mm -hmm. things like i just had a baby what type of diapers are best or how do i find a good deodorant without aluminum in it and i didn't know the answers and i didn't know where to point them towards um, the content online was either heavily based in data but really difficult for someone normal to understand mm -hmm. um, or you know easily accessible to the average person like a blog but not based in any type of science and so I wanted something that could sort of fit both where regular people could really understand their, their footprint. And I started that as a newsletter just on the side of my full-time job. Mm -hmm. And then right at the beginning of COVID, I realized that that newsletter could really become um, my passion and something that I wanted to spend all my time doing. And that really was how Finch was born. We have evolved into this platform that helps consumers make better purchasing decisions. I think in the age of greenwashing and mm -hmm. you know affiliate partnerships, it's really difficult to decipher what the real information is. And mm -hmm. consumers deserve to have this data democratized. And right now that's not really happening uh, in a way that I'm happy with. And so Finch rates products based on a variety of attributes ranging from you know, was this made in a country that used child labor to what's the carbon footprint, et cetera, and then everything in between. We use machine learning to scrape information off of the public domain, and then each product gets a score between one and 10. And how this works in one way is you download an extension on Chrome, and when you're shopping on Amazon, you type in a specific product, and we'll show you that it gets a, say, five out of 10, which is not great. And here are three alternatives that are similar to that product, but mm -hmm. better rated in case you want to make a better purchasing decision. And that's personally very exciting to me. And I get your mission and you did answer this, but I want to be more, put more emphasis on this. Why do this? I mean, it's not something that's easy to do. It's also, you know, getting the data and, and making sure it's up to date. So tell us a little more about why do this and, and why now? Why now is a really good question. And I think that that is pure luck. Um, I never started, I never thought about starting my own company. It's a very personal decision of why now. Um, 
I had the opportunity to go work for a startup as chief operating officer and just completely fell in love with everything about it and got totally caught the entrepreneurship bug. Um, and so when I started this company, I thought, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I'm so smart that I, that I thought of this idea myself and nobody else has done this before. In reality, many, many people have tried and failed, um, mostly due to timing, to be honest. Even people that started this three or five years ago um, failed because mostly the world just wasn't ready for it yet and consumers were not craving this type of information. And then because consumers weren't craving it, companies had no incentive to change any of their practices. And now it's a completely different time where Gen Z is increasingly being responsible for most of the buying power and they care about more they care more about the environment than any other issue facing the planet, according to a new, a new uh, report from Deloitte. Mm -hmm. And so, because of this, you know, we're at this flex inflection point where consumers are craving this, and companies are not prepared to share this information mm -hmm. because for so long they've been sharing data that just is inaccurate or um, completely greenwashed. Right? This is eco-friendly packaging or compostable, mm -hmm. when in reality that's not the case. And so I'm excited to really my end goal is to put Finch out of business and help companies mm -hmm. so that any company that um, that makes a product is reaching a certain level of sustainability already. And there aren't good versus bad. Everything is sort of reaching that bare minimum and everybody has access to the same information. I love that. And I love your mission to put yourself out of business, right? especially when you're doing something that's in the interest of the consumers and good for the society, the conduit should turn itself out of business. So I love that. Tell us the, give us a sense for the size and scale of your business. So right now we are at a really interesting point. You know, I think for anybody who started a company before they can probably relate the first couple of years, honestly, is just preparing for this thing to happen, mm -hmm. right? you're not coming out with a product within two weeks of starting, or at least I wasn't as a non-technical person. Um, props to anybody who is. And so for so long, we were sort of planning and envisioning and doing all these things. And right now, we actually just got our first contract this this week that we're signing. That's our first real revenue generating partnership, which is so right. exciting. Um, and I think from there, it will really just sort of snowball. And so we've we've gotten the first, we had our first round of funding we had $1.5 million. Um, we are about to get our first, you know, hopefully meaningful revenue. And then from there, we'll raise our seed round in the fall and hopefully grow our team. So right now there are five of us full time, around six or seven of us part time. Um, and we are, you know, just in the United States, we only operate on Amazon. So we have a lot of growing to do in the next several months. That's awesome. I love how you counted yourself both in the full time and the part time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not. No, no, no. I did not count myself <laughs> in the part time. The full time is just um, is me and then four others. But tell us what's your biggest challenge as a business? My biggest challenge as a business is probably that we only work for a certain amount of hours a day, if I'm being honest. I think it's, you know, there's never, when I first started this company, I thought any any entrepreneur who pulls all-nighters is just showing off unnecessarily. It's such an unhealthy habit and a way of living. Um, and now I'm at that point where there's, there's never a lack of things to do, right? We could all be pulling all-nighters and still not delivering things that we need to on time. And so I think it's just those, resource constraints of time and money, um, mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, it's, it's not a novel answer and I apologize for that, but that's really the truth where we have everything we need. Um, we just need more time to do it. Yeah. Makes sense. And especially at this stage, like you said, at being at that inflection point, just as a, as a macroeconomic situation, but also for finding that traction and then now wanting to scale makes a lot of sense. On the other side of it, what's the most exciting opportunity that you're targeting? I would say, you know, this this first revenue is really exciting because this we're talking mm -hmm. to a very well-known company who essentially will integrate our ratings 
in their back end because these companies don't have the resources to do that themselves as, no matter how big they are. And so to have the sort of, uh, to have the backing of a large company like this, I think will really explode our marketing, our credibility, um, just a lot of opportunities there, which is something I'm really excited about. I think the other thing um, is that I was lucky enough to be on the Today Show a couple of weeks ago, which was really nice. fun. Yeah. And I think as that becomes an ongoing opportunity where I'm able to come back and speak to millions of people on what to watch out for when they're looking at greenwashing words or buying certain products, mm -hmm. um, that's a huge amount of responsibility, but something that just makes me so excited that Finch really is becoming sort of the source of information for this type of data. That's really amazing and exciting to hear. So Lizzie, when you look back in the rear view mirror and think about things that have worked out and, and some that haven't, give us an example of, of both, if you will. Uh, maybe start with uh, a success story that you're really proud of and want to show off a little bit. And then also uh, one that did not and uh, became a lesson. Absolutely. So I loved, you know, you sent me these questions in advance and I loved thinking about this because I had so many that came to mind on both sides, <laughs> of course. Um, I think a success story is, you know, there are moments in an entrepreneur's journey that just really stick out um, that I'll probably never forget, regardless of what happens with Finch. And one of those moments is I decided to just send a cold LinkedIn message to the co-founder of Honey. Hmm. And I did this because I really admired what Honey did. They were really the most successful by far extension in the space. Oh. And because Finch was starting something similar, I thought it'd be great to have someone's advice on this who's actually been in Honey. I had absolutely no connection with with Ryan, the co-founder, but I sent him a message. He, uh, he wrote me back after I think only about a week, which was already such a win and so exciting. Yeah. He offered to, to chat. So we set up 30 minutes where I was really just planning on picking his brain, understanding how he grew the company, how he, you know, thought, thinks of extensions, how they're growing, et cetera, et cetera. And what ended up happening was that he, within 15 minutes of the call, agreed to invest in Finch. Wow. Um, and that was almost surreal. It was kind of like a dream because the fact that we were talking to this person who had just sold this similar mm -hmm. company for $4 billion, he had so much, um, so much experience and decided that he believed in Finch enough to to be an early investor was just such a vote of confidence for us and something that I will truly never forget. And I think the lesson there is, you know, I think a lot of times entrepreneurs have really big heads and can tend to be a little bit um, arrogant, but mm -hmm. other times they almost go in the opposite direction of like, well, this is never going to happen. I'm never going to be on the Today Show or I'm never going to hear from someone from Honey. So it's not even worth trying to do that. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned through this Honey experience and a, and a handful of others is you might as well just try and worst case, and I still, you know, mm -hmm. I reach out to people all the time on LinkedIn. Most of them don't ever get back to me. But what, it's like 30 seconds of my day that could really turn into something fantastic. And the only bad thing that comes out of it is that you lost 30 seconds. Um, and don't get me wrong, time is valuable, but uh, it's always worth it to, to reach out to those people because you never know what, what will come of it. True, especially when you know the returns can be outsized, right? So congrats again on, on pursuing these leads and you know just cold calling. I mean, this is the new world of cold calling, right? So that's pretty amazing and congrats again. Now Thank let's switch so gears a little bit and uh, move on to my favorite part of the show, which is the one line life lessons these are simple, profound one-liners, but I have often found them to be life-changing. Would really appreciate to hear some one-liners from you. I have a lot of them. Would you prefer that I just say the one line or explain it a little bit as well? Well, go with Either the Either way. Okay, perfect. So my first one is do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. And that is really, that, that requires some, some explaining, which is if you don't have time to do it right the first time, when are you gonna have time to do it over? And that is, you know, one of the first things that I did early on was I hired a lawyer and I hired an accountant because mm -hmm. I didn't want to spend any time doing that myself. I wouldn't have been good at it. And we would have had a lot of really horrible QuickBook reports and mm -hmm. bad contracts that 
over time we would have had to redo. Um, and so I feel really, really strongly that if you're able to um, just invest in that work early on and then it makes it so much easier down the road where you don't, like I, I haven't thought about my accounting or my legal issues in year, in literally in two years, basically because I know that someone's handling it and it's fantastic. Nice. So that's number one. Number two is um, nothing is permanent. And that means when you're in a really tough spot, um, that sort of lifts me up to think like, we're going to get out of this and it's going to be fine. But also when we have celebrations and when things are really good, sometimes good to ground yourself and, and humble yourself really to think like this is temporary and we still need to like keep the gas on the pedal and, and work really hard because this is not going to be forever. Mm -hmm. Um, the third is I'm sort of doing rapid fire here, but there's so yeah. many that I want to go through. The third is, um, don't let anyone define what you're capable of except for you. I think before I started this company, I had a really hard time in certain roles with managers just not believing in mm -hmm. my abilities. And I think a lot of people, I'm lucky that I just have a natural amount of confidence. I don't know where that came from, but I think a lot of people would have listened to their bosses and been like, I'm worthless. I'm never going to amount to anything. And mm -hmm. nobody else can tell you that except for yourself. And so that's really important to just listen to your gut. Um, fourth is you'll always feel better after a 20 minute walk. <laughs> that requires no explanation. Um, and then the last is the short-term pain is worth a long-term gain. So mm -hmm. things are going to be tough, but um, the payoff is is really valuable. Love those. Thanks, Lizzie, for sharing those. And for our audience, we have an entire collection at onelinelifelessons.com, and we'll have Lizzie's life lessons on there pretty soon. Lizzie, thanks again for making the time. I know it's really valuable. And uh, we really appreciate you coming here, sharing your journey with our audience. We'd love to keep track of your continued success and uh, bring you back on. Thank you so much. This was, this was really fun. Thanks for having me.